Lord be with you. Welcome to worship today, the transfiguration of our Lord, the end of our Epiphany season, the final Sunday with our Epiphany stars, uh, the soon, soon getting paving, paving the way for the Lenten season to come. Today we, we hear the story again of Jesus on the mountain, shining brightly for all to see. And today we, we hear about the promises he makes for us who don't necessarily have the gift of such a vision to hang on to. Our order of service is Holy Communion, setting four, setting one, excuse me, excuse me, setting four. And we begin our service with the order for confession and forgiveness found on page 94 of your red hymnal. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we've turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry. Humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Things we've done, things we failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. For his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is 553. Please remain standing. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to
to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First lesson is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah said to him, took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. 
Elisha kept, walk, kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into pieces. We shall read in unison Psalm 50. <clears throat> The Mighty One, God, God the Lord, Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising, rising of the sun to its setting. setting. Out, Out of Zion, Zion the perfection of beauty, God, God shines forth. Our God, God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. The second lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here in the readings. Please rise for the Owl of the Universe. <laughs> the Holy Gospel for the Transfiguration of our Lord is from Mark chapter 9. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with him anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them... He ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The word of the day is ambiguity. What does that mean? Ambiguity. Ambiguous. <clears throat> what does that word mean? Well, the dictionary says ambiguity is doubtfulness or uncertainty. As in, I'm feeling ambiguous about my new boss. I'm not sure if she'll be good or bad for the company. Or, this new medicine is supposed to help me, doctor says, but I read about the side effects and I'm not so sure. I'm feeling ambiguous about starting to take them. Ambiguous means doubtful, uncertain. And this word popped to mind as I was reading the gospel today, um, thinking about actually what had gone on before the gospel reading, thinking that some of Jesus' disciples had begun to feel ambiguous, uncertain about where Jesus was leading them. And if you notice in the Gospel reading, the first words in it were six days later. So if we want to talk about what's happening today, I think we have to go back in the story six days and figure out what, what, what happened six days ago that was so important that we're speaking about it again. So six days before the Transfiguration, Jesus 
had some words to say. And really, the be- and Jesus had some words to say that were not terribly relaxing or, or settling for the disciples. Here's what he said. He said, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciple, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then he called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? So that's what the disciples heard from Jesus six days before the mountaintop. And that's where the ambiguity began the doubts and the uncertainty. Because all of this was new talk. Talk about suffering and death. It wasn't the kind of end that they'd hoped for at all. This was new talk about a cross and the followers of Jesus needing to lose their life to find it. So six days ago with this speech, the ambiguity began. And what happened then, I had to reread for you. It's necessary background information as we walk into our gospel lesson this morning, six days later, and try to understand what this trip up the mountain by Jesus, Peter, James, and John was all about. So up the mountain we go. Jesus leads the way. He takes them up the mountain, not to simply put on a a light show or to show them his glory. There's no ambiguity or doubt in this time and place. Jesus is shining on the mountaintop, and on his side he has Moses and Elijah. And here we have Jesus framed by Moses and Elijah. Here God proclaims that Jesus has been the plan from day one. No need to be ambiguous. No need to doubt. No need to be uncertain. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan for Israel since Moses and the Exodus and since all, and Jesus is the one prophesied by all the prophets, including Elijah. Nothing had changed, except for one thing. What truly shook the foundations were the words that Jesus spoke six days ago. The claim that God's long-awaited kingdom would not come through a sword-wielding Messiah surrounded by angel armies, not through all-consuming flames and fire, but through the humiliating suffering of one man dying on a cross. No one saw this coming. It was an unexpected, earth-shattering new word. And yet today on this mountaintop, it's hard to imagine that Jesus ever said those words, because today Jesus is shining in power and in brightness, brighter than the sun, Mark says, pure and white and radiant. Today, all the feelings of ambiguity and doubt fade away. We don't know if Jesus said anything up there. Nothing is recorded, but we know what he was doing. It's as if our Lord was saying, you heard what I said six days ago, my friends. I talked about the Messiah suffering and dying, but now we're here six days later on this mountaintop. And this is also true. The Messiah will fulfill all that has been promised from the beginning. What will come will be hard and dark and painful, but it is the end God has planned. And you, Peter, James, and John, can push your ambiguity and your doubts and your uncertainty aside. If you follow me to the cross, you will go where God wants you to go. You can be certain of that. Transfiguration then for us. What does this strange mountaintop story say to us today? Well, transfiguration is a gift to the ambiguous disciple, the uncertain disciple, the doubtful disciple. 
Transfiguration is an unveiling, an opening of eyes to see, to really see. Transfiguration is reassurance to the wavering. Transfiguration is a call for disciples to stick to God's plan. God's, God leads. Jesus is God's man for the cross. That's what the transfiguration tells us. <coughs> and we hear this story and we say, lucky Peter, lucky John, lucky James. Look at the vision they got. If only we had something like that to lean on. If we only we had a vision that we could download when we needed it, when we were overwhelmed by darkness or doubt or ambiguity. If only we had a spiritual high like that to cling to, a holy moment that we could keep as a photo in our phone or somewhere, so that we would know when we're doubting or struggling that God's presence is here, that on that mountaintop we could see and taste and smell and see him as if he were standing right beside me. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Would that, if only we had our own small transfiguration that we could have in our back pocket to evaporate our ambiguity, to dispel our doubts, even in the hard times, a moment to treasure, a vision to hold on to, a snapshot that says, I saw him once in his glory. I know he is who he says he is, and I know he's with me now. I know that I can still follow. But almost, almost all of us don't have any of that. What did Jesus leave us? What have we got to rely on? We have a book. We have a little water in a bowl. We have some bread and some wine. And we have each other, the church. And that's about it. Now, compared to the shining countenance of our Lord on a mountaintop, it doesn't seem like much to hang on to. We don't have a vision, we have a book, and we have water and bread and wine and each other. But attached to all of them, we have one more thing, and that's what counts. We have a promise. A promise in each of these places from Jesus. A promise that surpasses any mountaintop experience. A promise that says, you don't have to climb any hill or experience any vision or leave the world below to meet Jesus. You don't have to go looking for Jesus. He comes down to you. He brings his very self to the stuff of life. In the word of life, he speaks and calls us. In the water of baptism, he washes and buries us and raises us. In the bread and the wine, he feeds and forgives and makes us new. And in this community, this collection of souls called St. John's, he promises to be present with his spirit among us, to work through us and make us shine his light in the whole world. Now this doesn't make everything easy, of course, because the thing about a promise is that you have to sooner or later actually believe it. <laughs> you have to believe the one who makes it. If you need proof for your reassurance, if you need irrefutable fact, undeniable evidence, then a promise won't reassure you either, fellow traveler. You'll have to wait for your own vision, your own mountaintop experience, your own miracle, and you may be waiting your whole life because only a very few are blessed with such a gift of a vision from God. Most of us are not. Most of us are only given a promise, that the promise that is this. In this word and in these sacraments, I am truly present and truly risen. And through my body, the church, I am here to bury and raise you with me every day, again and again and again, all of your life until my final day. I talked not too long ago to a very sick person who told me that they weren't asking why anymore when they prayed. They weren't trying to understand how or why this sickness happened to them. Instead, they, she said, what I pray for is to know and to feel God's presence with me. That's what I long for. And when I listen to pleas like this from the heart that come from great weakness, I'm quick to respond that feelings, feelings can be wonderful and encouraging 
and comforting. But feelings, even the good ones, come and go. They are temporary, and they can't be carried on forever. That's why when someone comes to me in my work as a pastor for private confession and forgiveness, when we're done the service, I never ask them the question, how do you feel? Or do you feel better now? Instead I ask, have you heard God's promise? And do you believe it? Because you and I know that in a given week or a given day or a given hour, we may feel forgiven, feel spiritually alive, feel close to God, only to have these feelings turn upside down in the next moment into feelings of dread, doubt, worthlessness, and shame, as if God was a million miles away. That's the trouble with feelings. They rise and they fall, they wax and they wane. When it comes to our yearning for God, feelings are thoroughly unreliable. And so the daily faith question for us needs to be not how do I feel about God and my faith, but will I get up this morning and will I take the leap? Will I take the leap and believe the promises said by God to me and for me? Will I hold on to what Jesus promise, promises is true for me? So hear and listen, because he says it again today. In the word, and the water, the bread, and the wine, in the sacraments, the word, and the church. That's what I give you. And I promise to be present here. In these things, in this place, among this people, you will find me. Whether you feel it or not. My goal and my prayer when I preach today is not that you will leave here necessarily feeling any different about your faith. My prayer is that you will catch the transfiguration vision for today. As Jesus was undeniably and gloriously present on that mountaintop, so is he undeniably and gloriously present here. Believe the promise. This is the promise I pray will grab and grasp you. I pray that you, like the disciples, will see Jesus only. Jesus only, breaking through the clouds, breaking through the haze of your life, the rising and falling of feelings and circumstances and situations and dramas, whatever they may be. My prayer is that you will be granted faith to make the leap to jump and grab Jesus' promise in word, in water, and bread, and wine in the church, and say, this is most certainly true for me. Promises trump feelings. Promises trump experience, visions. Promises trump even miracles. Promises are our only foundation for faith. Let us cling to what we've been promised the word, the water, the wine, the bread, the church, and Jesus promised to be present in all of these places. Give us faith, Lord, we pray, not to feel that you are here. Give us grace instead to take you at your word and hold your promise in our hearts. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We sing the hymn of the day, 827. Please remain standing.
confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 105. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the prayers. With gratitude for the gift of Christ and his revealing to us in word and sacraments, let us draw near to our Heavenly Father in prayer, asking his mercy for the church, the world, and all who need his loving kindness. Give grace to this congregation of St. John's, O Lord. Let all who gather here in Jesus' name day by day see him more clearly, love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask a special blessing on little children, not only those dear to us, but all the children of the world, those who suffer from war, homelessness, hunger, and fear. Shelter them from evil. Shine the light of your love upon them. Give them grace to hear Jesus' voice in our words and to see his dear faith in our face and our deeds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Moses, the lawgiver, and Elijah, the prophet, bore witness to your son, the king of the nations. Grant their wisdom and righteousness to the leaders of the world. Through their decisions and actions, let them bear witness to their coming king. Help them use authority in accordance with your will. Help them to lead their people into paths of justice, righteousness, and peace. We pray for peace in Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Yemen, Sudan, and Korea. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shed the light of your salvation on all who sit in shadows of pain, fear, loneliness, despair, or sorrow, including, we pray, for Karen Grove, Nadine Kruger, Ted Shep, Kadira Fraser, Egon Litzman. Let them see the light of your countenance and grant them your saving help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort all who mourn with the certainty that you embrace their beloved dead with your son's light and life. Let Jesus be the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. Help us to listen to him and to see him alone in every circumstance of life. In your good time, let us with all whom Christ has redeemed, behold him face to face. Let us worship him in the glory he shares with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Are there any other requests for prayer this morning? Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Our worship continues with the offering. We sing hymn 315. Thank you.
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who, sharing our life, lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own bright, brilliant light. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. of this world. You led your people Israel by a pillar of fire as you delivered them from bondage, brought them to the promised land, and by the light of Bethlehem's star you led the sages to your beloved son, revealing him to the nations as King of kings and Lord of lords. In words, signs, and wonders your son gave the light of hope to the disappointed and healing to the disenchanted. And then at the appointed time, he stretched out his hands on the cross, showing forth the brilliance of a life freely given, that all may have life in him. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray that by your Holy Spirit you will bless and sanctify this Holy Communion, that we may be illumined in faith as we partake of Christ's body and blood, renewed in the forgiveness of sins and joyous in our hope for your eternal kingdom. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The light has shattered the darkness. Let us follow the star and behold our God. Please rise. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> A
warm welcome, everyone, to worship today. And uh, it's kind of become my duty, and I guess it will be for a while now, to just remind us of our scheduling because, because of my new part-time position. We, we, we have some scheduling we have to pay attention to every week. So a reminder that next week, worship will be with our friends at Ansgar, Danish Lutheran. And remember that the Danes get up earlier than us, so <laughs> their worship begins at 10.30. So that's 10.30, we're joining the, the congregation of Ansgar. And in two weeks, this is going to drive you crazy with calendars, schedules, and clocks. Two weeks you have to come to church early here because we're having a combined service with our German, uh, German congregation. And we're gathering at 10 o'clock for church combined, followed by our annual general meeting which will be happening right after our 10 o'clock service in two weeks. And we have, we have a calendar. Uh, Jason and uh, the Welts have been working hard these last few days putting together our annual reports, which include uh, a real beautifully nice, nicely laid out calendar up until the end of April. So if you stick that on your fridge and keep that as a reference point, you should be okay for the next few months anyway. Uh, thank you to the Welts and to Jason for that. And because of that, I'm going to be exiting here because we'd like you to stop on the way out and pick up your package for the annual meeting. Save us a lot of postage, and that should have everything you need. If you don't have, make sure you have one. If you don't have one, please let us know. We'll get that sorted right away. Any other announcements to be made? Yes. Oh, yes. The Sandwich Club, this hearty, wonderful bunch, and you're getting very quick at making sandwiches. A meeting at what time? 9.30, 9.30 uh, in the hall, and you make sandwiches, have some coffee, and take them over to Sacred Heart to support their work with the homeless in our neighborhood. Wonder. Oh, Valentine's treats too, that'll be really nice. So everybody's welcome. You don't have to know a thing except how to spread a piece of bread with something, and, and uh, it's, great. It's, a great, it's a good feeling to do that. So blessings on that ministry as well. Anything else? I think we're good. Our sending hymn is 671. Shine, Jesus, shine. Please stand. Yeah. 